Kerrville City Council workshop is opened. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, we have the ability to call in on the telephone. A member of the public may address the City Council regarding an item on the agenda today. Comments must be relevant to the agenda item. This is not intended to be a question and answer session. Speakers must call in by 945 a.m. and register with the Zoom moderator. Citizens may also submit written comments to be read into record. Written comments must be received by 9.45 a.m., either emailed to uh, Shelley or dropped off at the City Hall Utility Payments drop box. Each speaker will be limited to four minutes. And Shelley, do we have any callers this morning? No, ma'am. All right. So we have a full morning of budgets. So hope everybody is ready for numbers. Uh, Kerrville Economic Development Board, KEDC, um, is uh, Gil available to visit with us? Gil and Teresa, are you on the line? We are here. All right. Morning. Morning. All right, we're ready to hear from you guys. Okay, let me see. Ah, it worked. All right. Sorry, I get excited with little things. <laughs> the mayor, members of the uh, city council, uh, good morning and thank you for having us here. Hey, we're going to have a 15-minute uh, presentation. That's going to be uh, Teresa Metcalf, who has up our breed division and does some of our marketing as well, uh, and myself as well, just uh, presenting our plan of action and our proposed budget for the organization. So we're going to be going over our year-to-date uh, deliverables, uh, what we have in regards to our uh, pipeline of projects, uh, roadmap, uh, which is basically what we're going to be working on for the next year and a few months, and then the actual budget itself. So as far as uh, what we're going to be, uh, what we've done uh, since last uh, time that, that we presented that to you all in a workshop, uh, our deliverables, we're going to go over our uh, uh, ecosystem, which is our two-year roadmap uh, for economic development for Kerrville and for Kerr County. And I don't expect you to read this. Uh, I know that we've uh, provided copies in the past. But this is basically our internal working document. Uh, we apply our vision to this particular document, and it's got seven uh, different uh, uh, lines of engagement, as I like to refer to them. So we're going to go through each one of those as far as what each engagement is and what we have done in each one of those. And that, that ranges from business retention and expansion to marketing, human capital, so on and so forth, all the way to uh, corporate recruitment. Gail, uh, so, Gail, excuse me, we do have a copy that we can read. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Fantastic. So, uh, so with that, we will start with our first line of engagement, that's business retention and expansion, and I will turn it over to uh, Teresa, who's going to be covering the next few uh, uh, lines. Thank you, Gil, and thank you, Mayor Blackburn and City Council for allowing us to present to you today. Um, and I just want to talk just ex very briefly about that ecosystem and why we refer back to it in our daily operations um, on a daily basis. Um, and really because each part of that ecosystem work in unison with each other, they're all tied together and build off of each other, which is why um, we move through these deliverables. Um, as we move through the deliverables, you'll see some of these things repeated. So I'm just going to focus on um, one part of each of these deliverables, um, even though you'll see some of the things repeated. So on a business retention expansion focus, um, we did speak to these on a quarterly basis as reported on companies that we visited. And as we started our 2019, um, we did do most of our brief visits in person as most of us were operating. And little did we know that our 2020 was going to be a completely different version of how we were operating. Um, on this slide, I would like to focus on that business survey that we developed during COVID 
and our response to that survey. And that really highlights how our community was not only collaborating during COVID, but also how it was communicating with KEDC as a whole. And we, we developed or, or worked in partnership um, with a, a, our regional partners on an EDO. They developed a survey early on, a business impact survey for COVID. And we distributed that out, not only to our community, they distributed it out regionally and they received 258 respondents for their survey. And that went out throughout the entire San Antonio area, San Marcos area. So a very regional effort. And when we pushed out our business survey a little bit later on in the process of um, looking at how our businesses were impacted by COVID for our community, just as Kerr, Kerr County, Kerrville area, we received 194 respondents to that survey. So it just really spoke to how we were communicating with each other, how our businesses were communicating with each other and how we were collaborating as a community. Um, and it, that just really impacted me. Um, so we can move on to the next one. So when we talk about human capital and workforce, again, we started out our year with our first round table event, which was phenomenal. We were able to gather together very key parts of our working community to talk about workforce, what that looked like, how we wanted to proceed in our fiscal year to develop um, our workforce and the impact that that would have on not only some of our small businesses, but on our top, for our top employers and that really just came together in a whole different way last Thursday when Julian and Dale Robertson and Shannon Herrera Mendoza were able to come for the Kill Deer announcement. They were here Thursday for a lunch event after that. And so not only were the announcements made for that $364,000 for the Texas Skills Development Fund for them, but we were also able to announce that All Plastics has received their skills development fund um, for $115,000. So just within a one year period of time, our community and the Alamo Colleges has received $479,000 in skills development grants towards training. And those employers will see that, in, that influx of employees, they'll see training um, and workforce initiatives. Um, and that's, those are really historic numbers for our community. And so being able to bring those state representatives and leadership into our community has just really been um, very rewarding for us as an organization. And again, it just speaks to all of the efforts that our community has put in throughout the course of this last year and welcoming people into our community. So when we talk about encouraging entrepreneurs, we started out again planning um, one of our biggest initiatives, which was going to be our small business series or with the office of the governor. And we realized very quickly that we were going to have to shift that um, with COVID. Uh, as I think most of you know, Gil and I are cancel, postpone. Um, those are not words in our vocabulary. And so the small business series was not something that we were going to give up on. And of course, I think the office of the governor uh, and all of the people in their organization, they have the same mentality. And so we were able to work in coordination with them and be co-hosts with that small business um, webinar series. And so in April, we were co-hosts with the two other partners um, and we had over 4,000 participants in that webinar. Um, and then there was a series of four others in the, I think probably, I think it was a span. I think they did it every two weeks after that and they're continuing to do that as information, of course, changes coming out of the office of the governor. 
And so we felt, again, very fortunate to be um, already partnered up with them to be able to do that webinar. And we've pushed out, again, other webinars that we've created within our office to be able to keep information coming down um, through various resources out into the community. And um, the other part of this is the Over the Fence podcast, which kind of came from that small business series, which I started wanting to be able to get the information from the panelists that we had arranged to be in that small business series, um, giving our community the opportunity to still hear from them. And so it was just another way for us as an organization to pivot during this time um, and again, be able to communicate and connect with the community still during this time and be able to give them that information that they would have received during that small business series. So during our marketing efforts, we have, well, I start to look at these numbers as we've kind of worked through the year. And um, sometimes when you're in the midst of things, you kind of get lost in um, what you're doing. And as I look at, even from my perspective, as I look at, um, look at what we have been able to do as an organization, as a community coming together. Um, I just, you know, I, I'm totally blown away by it. And I think, you know, Gil will talk about it as I think on a local level compared to a national level on how we've been impacted by COVID. But I think it speaks to why we are kind of weathering this time period um, different in comparison to some other regions. And it is because we are all coming together. And so these aren't just KEDC numbers. These are, these are how you as a, you know, as a community have been receptive to KEDC as well. So, and again, this is, I wanna just take a moment to talk about Over the Fence podcast and the reason that I've been able to connect with the community and people have been perceptive and wanting to have conversations with me is because people are willing to collaborate and share their stories. And so it's just been a great, fun experience. And um, that two-part series that I was able to do with Greg Richards and just the amount of business information that was in there and was able to be presented to the community um, was just phenomenal. So, um, and that's just one of 16. So, and Gil will kind of go into more about the 34 magazine articles, um, one in particular. So um, I'll let him kind of go into that a little bit more. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, let's see. Here, I'll go back and uh, just quickly uh, with these numbers, something else that I want to point out is uh, uh, both Teresa and myself, we were invited to be uh, a panelist and or a speaker. Uh, I think it was two national conferences, a national webinar, and then an aerospace a panel at the state level. Uh, and that happened as of late, just like in the last two months. So that was a great opportunity to really get the curl out there. Uh, the 4,400 uh, participants uh, in one of the webinars that we hosted, again, that was a partnership with the Office of the Governor. And then something that, that Theresa really, uh, this was uh, one of her ideas and she just ran with it. And, and there was a lot of support with it uh, community-wide is curveltogether.com. And that was, again, our response to, to, to uh, being able to have one central point of information one portable information uh, when COVID started happening back in March. Uh, with that, now let me wrap up the last three lines of engagement. The uh, stakeholder communication, um, as you can see, we've uh, been doing uh, some quarterly reporting uh, with our uh, stakeholder groups, and we're also issuing the uh, KDC highlights. It's a monthly bulletin newsletter uh, report, uh, whatever we want to call it that is specifically designed just for our stakeholders and each one of our respective boards. 
We had a retreat late last year, and we're looking to follow that one up either end of this year or beginning of next year, uh, whether it's in person or virtual, we have to, that's yet to be determined. One-on-one -on -one visits, we continue to do that uh, with as many uh, stakeholders. And remember, we've got uh, four different boards on our uh, board, uh, on our, uh, that support our organization that, that we report to. And then as far as economic development forums, we participated, we're supporters of the Hill Country Economic Summit. Uh, at that event, we had a roundtable uh, discussion with, uh, with Commissioner Julian Alvarez, and some of you all were a part of that. And then we had a second roundtable with KMM, uh, our newest the corporate citizen in our top five employers, and happened last week. Organizational housekeeping, when Teresa and I came on board, one of the first things that we did was we needed to run a tighter ship. So that's when we, uh, we created uh, and grabbing information from my immersion tour, the, uh, the 2050 plan. There was another economic development plan that had been done a few years back and put together the roadmap. And that's exactly what that is. It's a roadmap to get us to our first two years before we start getting into the bigger vision, our five-year plan. Policies and procedures. Um, a little embarrassed to say that there was none, you know, when we came on board or they were non-existent at least. So we've already drafted those up for the organization and they're in the approval process. And then we're revisiting the economic incentives guidelines, trying to tighten those up as well. Okay, so this is what I like to say, this is where the rubber meets the pavement, uh, corporate recruitment. Um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of EDOs as such as ourselves are gauged by well, what have you done for me lately? What are the companies that you have? What is your uh, uh, project pipeline look like? If we generated, we worked on 32 leads, which I will say for a community and organization our size is, uh, it's a little bit more than what I had expected. Uh, seven of those were from, uh, from internal. Uh, it was us uh, conducting outreach through our network or whenever we would um, hear of a certain company that possibly was looking at Texas, uh, you know, SkyMaster is one example. Then we would conduct that outreach and start working it before anybody else would get to them. We did have one, one walk-in at our office uh, that turned into a lead. Uh, cold calling, we don't have the staff size to, to do cold calling. It calls at the office, those, we netted the three that turned into leads. Uh, site selectors, we got calls from five different site selectors. And then relationships is uh, consultants uh, or corporate executives. We had four leads from that. And then 12 RFPs that we submitted to the office of the governor. Out of all those, we ended up with five active prospects for the Kerr County area. And I'll get into that here in a bit. And two of those uh, came to fruition, which were either facilitated by us or closed by the KABC. E coming back to what Teresa was saying, and just to kind of tie everything up, uh, we've, we've already had some pretty good coverage as far as economic development for Kerrville once we started launching our two-year roadmap and what have you. But with the announcement last week, these are all the different entities, media entities, in addition to our local ones, which are in italics, uh, that covered the event or, or covered the actual story of uh, an aerospace a company coming into Kerrville, Texas. So it, we had a, and that, these are the ones that I could find and I'm sure social media was also going nuts uh, according to uh, Office of the Governor and Texas Workforce Commissioner at, when they followed up on their uh, media reports. Um, the one that I do want to point out is this particular article. This is uh, Area Development Magazine. There's these, this is one of three, maybe four trade magazines that are read by your top consultants, um, corporate executives, and site selectors. And if you're able to have a magazine like Area Development cover your community or a project in your community, then that is our target audience. So this is the one that, that really sets, sets themselves apart from everybody else in regards to what we do. The local coverage is great, but it's at the local level. And it'll get out nationally eventually, but this is a very, very targeted approach to the people that we want to get in front of. So I expect to uh, to have some uh, get some good traction out of this particular coverage. And that's and this is again we still we haven't really started working the uh, editorial side of uh, of promoting this project. 
Okay, so that'll segue into our active projects. So I mentioned five, and these are the five, and those are the two that have come into Kerrville uh, since we uh, launched our two-year roadmap. So SkyMaster, we've been working that project for a little over a year, and obviously we all know that it's Killdeer Mountain Manufacturing. 400 uh, jobs, very good paying jobs. Um, and ACW means they are paying above county wages. And that is a threshold that uh, is used in economic development to see whether your project is going to help move the needle as far as uh, creating wealth in the community. And this pr project most definitely, and in order to qualify for some of these state programs, they have to hit that threshold. So, so they definitely check that box. A tin roof that is prime metal buildings, which is off of a Harper Road. It's a medical metal metal fabricator, and uh, they're getting ready. I think they already started hiring, so they're part manufacturing. They're also going to have a commercial component to it. So it's a new addition to our uh, manufacturing uh, family here in the Cur uh, Curville area. And then the other three, those are the code names: Blue HQ. It's also in the aerospace. Uh, sector. It's a small uh, firm. Um, they're looking at a small facility and there would be a group of consultants that would be bringing in uh, federal uh, uh, delegations, uh, those involved in aerospace, uh, a little bit of training as far as uh, uh, law enforcement as well. Uh, Project Replenish, that's also a small operation. It's in the medical uh, and health sector. Uh, about the 20 person operation and they're also uh, actively looking for a facility and I know Theresa has been working those two projects and then the other one's project Vista that one is not in Kirk County it's actually just on the other just literally a stone's throw away on the other side of the county line uh, this is a massive uh, manufacturing operation uh, it came to us uh, by a very highly one of the top five site selectors, individual site selectors in, in, the, in the nation called us up and said, uh, we have this project coming. I mean, we know you can't put any any uh, funds into this, but we wanna know what your housing is like, what's the quality of life, because this company, and they're coming in from California, I believe, yeah, they're, they're, they're gonna be recruiting from a large area and they are gonna be recruiting uh, employees from, from Kerrville. So, uh, it's great that a site selector of that caliber is calling us up for, uh, for support as far as information, research, so on and so forth for a project that's going to have that kind of uh, impact in our area. E okay, so now wrapping up here, let me go through the uh, roadmap again. And that's the, uh, the two-year roadmap, and we're three-quarters of the way on the first year of the two-year. And the takeaways here is we're developing now, transitioning from launching, really launching our organization, branding Kerrville at the national level, to now developing a cluster now that we have something, the aerospace and aviation, and now focusing on, on getting people jobs. And a lot of it has to do because of COVID, entrepreneur development, starting to, to work with some of our local entrepreneurs, and then uh, develop what we have as far as some of our current businesses, and on the recruitment side, we'll be recruiting where we can. Uh, I've got Tesla on there. And I think now it kind of makes sense because, because a company such as KMM uh, can potentially be a supplier for a Tesla that's coming into Austin, even though that they're about two hours away for automotive manufacturers that, of that size, their catchment area is typically around two hours uh, in distance. Additional goals for our uh, Roadmap is going to be uh, now looking at the human capital. We're going to add an upscaling workforce component to it. Economic resiliency because of COVID. Uh, nobody was shielded from this. Everybody got affected. So now what do we need to do to now really start diversifying our uh, economic base to have a more resilient uh, economy? Okay. So on the budget, in closing here, what we have for, for the budget, please keep in mind that we, we were very cognizant of uh, the COVID, uh, the coronavirus pandemic when it happened. And we came forth and we uh, volunteered a budget reduction because, you know, Teresa and I were, were talking to all these businesses that were calling our office about, well, what do we need to do, so on and so forth. We're losing business, we're losing employees and this is before things got really bad 
And our message was, well, you need to tighten the belt, you need to, you know, pivot, you need to shift, so on and so forth. And we said, well, we need to do the same thing. If that's what we're, you know, that's the advice that we're giving. So we we came back and we volunteered a 20% uh, reduction from our budget. At that point, moving forward, and the same will be true now for our next fiscal year. So as you can see on the right hand column, those are all the uh, reductions that we're proposing. On the recruitment side, uh, we brought it down to basically we're cutting that out. Does not mean that we're not going to be recruiting. It just means that we're not going to be hiring any consultants or other entities to do recruiting for us. We're going to be doing everything in house, how we had already been doing marketing, uh, website design. Uh, we can operate with a very minimal budget, staff training, same thing, conferences, meetings, meals, entertainment, travel. There's huge cuts in that one because we don't anticipate any travel in the near future. Uh, contract services, that goes back to consultants as well. Uh, the big one's going to be the KBC service agreement. We were able to renegotiate that after uh, my predecessor had left uh, right before uh, COVID happened. So we re uh, renegotiated that and there was a $36,900 savings when we did that. Uh, we had a couple of little increases in our budget, uh, budgeting for next year. So the subtotal is $106,500 minus the $22,500 puts us at about $84,000 in, uh, in uh, proposed a reduction of our budget, which is 21%. And as you can see, the, uh, what the, we are requesting uh, from the EIC is $197,500 down from the initial request of $250,000 the, the year before. And for the city and the other stakeholder entities, uh, we're bringing it down for our request from $50,000 to $39,500 uh, each of those entities. And that, again, that is a 21% cut across the board. So that puts us at a total of 316,000 for our uh, uh, operations uh, for our budget. Uh, we do have a, at the rate that we're going, we're gonna have somewhere between a 35,000 to a $40,000 carryover from this current budget, even with a, with a proposed um, uh, reductions, uh, the volunteer reductions. So that's gonna help us manage and, uh, our budget for uh, next fiscal year. So in closing, uh, as far as the budget, again, we were very cognizant of, of the COVID situation that everybody, every business is in. Uh, and just like many businesses, we did a, a pivot where we went from the macro to a more micro level. Like how do we get people back to work? How do we, what do we need to do to get the sales tax revenue at a healthy level, which has gotten really healthy. Uh, our goal for the next fiscal year is now now that we have some of these projects that are coming to fruition, we have a real shot at developing a cluster, uh, an industry cluster. And for the budget, uh, it is a between the uh, roadmap and the budget, it's a very proactive plan of action, uh, yet affordable for a community our size. I will say, just in closing, is five, six months down the road, if we're in a position where we might start really promoting, you know, our project or some of our successes, uh, just to be mindful, maybe just to keep the door open for us to maybe come back and be at a point where we might need some additional money for a particular campaign. Uh, so we're not sure about that, but just definitely just, just be mindful of that, that uh, to keep that door open, should we be in that position. And that concludes our uh, budget uh, report and year-to-date deliverables. So we are happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Gail. Um, I must say uh, you've done a great job here in uh, reducing your budget. Council, questions? I have some, or a couple. I just have a couple detailed questions. Going back to the business retention expansion survey, you had 194 um, surveys that you were able to, to receive out of how many that you sent? Ooh. And you can get back to me later on that. Um, yeah, that's the... That's, uh, Actually... Um, good question, so, Teresa. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so that was actually sent out on various platforms um, via our social media. And, um, but I can tell you that that was, that hopefully was distributed through 
uh, the Chamber of Commerce eblast, and their eblast format goes out to um, approximately, um, I think, uh, they have a, a list of two thousand. I thought it would be something like that. Um, well, that's that's you can even get back to me later if you if you find out it's different from that. And then the other question I had was, so the round table that took place where KMM was <clears throat> one of the top five, one of the table, and there were five other top employers. Would you be able to disclose who those five employers were out of curiosity? Yes, uh, James Avery was there, All Plastics, uh, the State Hospital, and Peterson Medical okay. Center. Okay, great. Thank you. Mr. Mayor has joined us. Any questions from you, sir? No. Uh, I don't know about everybody else, but I have still been celebrating last Thursday. You guys, uh, as just uh, everybody I talk to is just so excited about that. And uh, we thank you for all of your good work. And uh, we look forward to uh, more exciting things like that. So anyone else with any any comments? Anything? Gil, this is Gary Cochran. I just... You morning. Know, uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, you know, I'm going to own up. I have been somewhat hesitant and I wouldn't say critical, but at times skeptical. Uh, and I think the, the analogy that I've used for the last several years is, you know, boy, if we could just get a solid base hit, then I'd be a lot more supportive and feel good about this. And uh, I just want to say that you delivered a grand slam home run and um, just very thankful, very appreciative of all the work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, council member. And, uh, I'll go out on a limb. I'll just I'll say that uh, we're just getting started. <laughs> that's good news. No, that's, that, that's good news. <laughs> that's, that's, and that look, I can say that because that's 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 how I I, I operate. And 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 Teresa's definitely come on board. You know, with with that model. It's it's that's yeah. We're just getting started, and we're having fun. That's that's you know that's important. That's great. That's good. You're that's a good that's job. Good. Okay. Anything from anybody? One last thing. Thank you again. We look forward to a year of some surprises, maybe. And uh, thank you for all your good work. Thank you, Teresa, as well. Thank you. All right. Next on our schedule is uh, the Economic Improvement Corporation, EIC, and Amy. So this is going to be um, pretty quick. Good morning, Mayor and Council, by the way. So we're going to be going over a one-page handout that should be at your places. And it says Economic Improvement Corporation 21 budget up at the top. Um, we discussed this with the EIC in both their July and August meetings. Um, so they have seen it and they voted on it yesterday to approve this. This will be coming to Council um, next. So we're going to be talking about the second column over that is the fiscal year 21 proposed budget. Um, they don't have a lot of line items, so I'm just going to go through them individually. The um, first that I'm going to start with is under the revenue section sales tax. So that's obviously their biggest line item in their budget. Um, and we have it budgeted at 3.5 million. And this is exactly calculates the same way um, from the general fund budget that we've already discussed with y'all and that you've already seen. So it's um, the same 6% reduction from the fiscal year 20 budget that y'all saw on the general fund side, but this is just the EIC portion of it. When we get sales tax in, two thirds of it goes to the general fund and one third of it goes to the EIC. Um, next is interest, which um, looks pretty paltry there at $9,000, and that's due to um, the significant decrease that we're seeing in um, interest rates right now. Um, EIC invests most of their money in a, um, a local government pool account. It's called Tex Pool. It's kind of like a money market account for governments. It's currently earning like 35 basis points, so less than 1%. Um, but it is completely liquid and available for them to use at any time. Um, so that wraps up the revenue. Um, on the expenditure side, um, in the administrative expenditure section, we have $500 for supplies, $10,000 for professional services. Um, there's nothing specific budgeted for that. That would just be 
um, probably for outside legal counsel if it was needed, but there's no specific plans for that. Um, KEDC is in at the 197.5 that Gil just presented. And then the administrative services fee is what EIC pays to the city um, for our support services. And it's remaining at the same 185,000 that, um, that is budgeted for fiscal year 20. So no change there. Moving down the line, we have debt service. So EIC pays for debt service on three of our debt issuances related to quality of life projects. You can see there um, River Trail and the sports complex. Um, you'll notice that middle one says series 2012 River Trail. This is one that um, we'll be bringing to you um, hopefully at your August 25th meeting um, to do a refunding on. Um, and we um, expect to have lower rates and a lower debt service. But right now, this we're putting this in the budget at the current debt service. So we're just assuming the current rate, current structure, um, but um, we're likely to see an actually a lower amount um, in 21 after that refunding is completed. The refunding wouldn't happen until October at least. So it's gonna be after the budget is passed. So I don't feel comfortable trying to project what rates we might get, but it would be lower than this amount. Moving down to projects. Um, the projects that we have listed here are projects that we actually have signed agreements for and SkyMaster that's in the process of developing a signed agreement. Um, so we are not speculating on, you know, well, we might have another quality of life project or something like that. We just have put in here the actual projects. So we have Thompson Drive Partners, which is the landing. Um, we are looking at, um, they have a, a funding agreement that allows for three payments of $283,000. Um, we've already made the first payment, and those payments are contingent upon them meeting different um, construction milestones. So we're expecting that they'll meet the milestones for the second payment um, any time now, and that we'll pay that by the end of this fiscal year, and then there'll be one remaining payment in 21. Um, airport projects, that's on a reimbursement basis as the projects proceed. Um, it's possible they may not finish all of their projects next year, but we went ahead and put that um, entire budgeted amount in, um, but it is on a reimbursement basis as the projects proceed. And Doyle School, um, we're also estimating the split between years there, but they're well on their way with um, architecture plans and should be um, moving on to construction pretty quickly here. So um, so we're estimating 450,000 of their $500,000 funding agreement would be paid in 21. And then this is um, something that EIC specifically requested, um, doing a downtown river trail feasibility study next year. So this isn't actually building a river trail. This would be more professional services um, looking at a potential expansion on river trail. And then the last item there is SkyMaster. Um, the $20,000 that you see in fiscal year 21 would be an interest payment on a loan um, between the city and um, KPUB that EIC is paying for. Um, so that's what that $20,000 represents. And one thing to note, um, EIC's budget is in your proposed budget book. Um, but there is nothing about SkyMaster in that proposed budget book because this happened after the proposed budget book was issued. So, um, so you would be um, voting on a budget that has changed slightly from the budget that was released on July 31st. And it does have this SkyMaster project added. We've also taken interest income down a little bit because their cash balance would be lower because of the SkyMaster project as well. Um, but anyway, um, EIC um, really focuses on their cash balance and how much, um, how much money they would have available for projects during the year. So given this scenario, um, we'd, uh, EIC would end the year with a $2.7 in cash. Um, you know, it is a pretty conservative sales tax projection. We are continuing to see good sales tax results, but we do want to be conservative with 
um, with our numbers. Um, so anyway, um, along the bottom there, though, you'll see those um, projected cash balances. Obviously, that's if there's no additional project spending, but it does give you an idea of what um, kind of numbers you're looking at. And on the sales tax, the, pro um, the projections out through 24, that's just a 2% increase in sales tax. We're very hopeful that, you know, if we have a decrease, that there's a, a rebound that's at a higher level than 2%. But this is just kind of to give you the magnitude um, and get an idea of kind of a rough number for cash projections. And all that you'll actually be passing is the 21 budget and the expenditures for um, 21. Any questions? Council, anybody? Gary, you're on EIC. Anything to add? No, we went through it last night. Yes. Yeah. So you're good with it. Good. Delay, Mayor. No, no me. Okay. All right. All right. Self I'm Great. I'm excited to see the feasibility study. I think that uh, for the river, uh, I think that'd be great. So uh, we thank them for that. So, all right. Thank, thank you, you, Amy. And I would we'll make one comment because at our EIC meeting last night, sure. uh, we uh, also heard from Kristen Hedger. Uh, she had some comments to make, and my I had a question for her that. Um, asked her about it through the consideration process, what did quality of life in some of these projects that we've approved over the years come into play? Mm -hmm. And she was very emphatic that it had a huge part in the decision making of where they wanted to bring their corporate businesses and also have their employees live and work. So just, you know, hands up or high fives to the EIC and the city of Kerrville for spending the money, the investment, uh, to put in those quality of life projects because now we're starting to see some of the benefits of them. Going to pay off. Oh, good question. Absolutely. That's, that. that's great. That is uh, one, great. one of the things I've learned uh, from Gil Salinas and economic development is that how much companies come in and they're looking for a good community mm -hmm. for their workers, mm -hmm. not just a place for their plant, but are there amenities, is there quality of life, you know. Uh, and, and also, I would say, uh, stable government. Yeah. I would think so. Well, and two of those quality of lives, one would be the sports complex and, and the other would be our river trail, for definitely. That, uh, yeah, and we, we have, we've invested a lot of money over the years in those projects, and uh, I know personally we've got some serious questioning of why we would do that, but I think it's important that the citizens realize that it's been an investment. It's not just about putting something pretty in. It's an investment in our community. Mm -hmm. Uh, she was. It was an interesting conversation because she basically said, you know, they were getting wooed by numerous uh, other cities, particularly up in their area. And but when they flew their corporate staff down here, they all said, of course, it was in February. She said, we spoke a lot. Easy sale. Yeah, she goes, it was minus twenty when they left. And they short sleeves when they got here. But she said they were just blown away. They said, what a great place to live. And so I think it's yeah. uh, I think it says a lot for our city staff and our yeah. citizens and our Thank leadership. You. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you hear that you hear you hear someone like Gil saying that that that's important, but to actually hear it from someone that's been recruited yeah. is really uh, that's powerful. An endorsement. So, mm -hmm. well, and kudos to our past councils and yep. and uh, as really they have, have the way <laughs> have uh, because a couple of these uh, they've uh, there's been a lot of controversy about it, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, they've looked to the future, which is our job. So. So thank you, Gary, for sharing those words with us. Mm -hmm. And um, just overall, thank you to our EIC. So keep up the good work. And our last budget is going to come from the CVB. And do we have somebody on the line to talk to us? Yes, ma'am. We have presenters Charlie McElvain and Julie Davis. Good morning, Charlie and Julie. Good morning. How are each of you? Good boy. Good. Thank you. You may go ahead. Tell us. All right. Thank you. you got. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council, City Administration, and media. It's good to be with you today. Before we get into our presentation, I do want to commend Gil and Teresa, KEDC, EIC, and the city on successfully bringing Kildeer Mountain Manufacturing to Kerrville. That will be a plus for each of us. The uh, The impact that, that uh, COVID-19 has had on our community has been pretty devastating. 
uh, when you look at what we've seen, hotel occupancy tax rate impact for uh, for 2020 versus 2019 in March, we were down 52 percent. Of course, the uh, major impact hit us about mid March. We we do have slides that are. Some reason we're having some a little challenge here on our uh, presentation. I'll go ahead and continue to talk while we're working on getting the slides up. Can you still hear me? You yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. In March, our hotel occupancy rate was down 52% over last year. In April, it was 81%, 81.12% over, over last year. In May, it started coming back up a little bit. We were down 50.69%. And in June, it's back up to 13.22% for the quarter that for the third quarter that gave us uh, we were down 47.1 percent what we were seeing in in group business and group cancellations let's see can you can you see the uh, slides now there we yes. go yeah okay yes. good yeah we have we've had 133 groups cancel that's meeting and convention groups canceled since mid-March. That's a, a loss of 13,505 hotel room nights. And it's a revenue loss of $1,325,110 in hotel room revenue loss. That doesn't include food and beverage or anything other than just hotel room revenue. And it's an estimated loss of hotel occupancy tax of $172,264. That's based on the 13% that, that we're seeing coming into the city now. It's an economic impact loss of $4,516. Our events cancellations since mid-March, we've had 94 events canceled. 29 of those were multi-day events. <clears throat> 29 of those were multi-day events and we don't do the economic impact studies every year we do them about every three to four years on the various events but the triathlon was an estimated economic impact loss of 1.3 million dollars james avery golf classic was a little over half million dollars at five hundred and ten thousand dollar loss the chalk festival was over three hundred thousand dollars Kerrville Festival of the Arts was 726,000 and Robert Earl King's Fourth on the River is $816,000 loss for the community. And that's certainly not everything, but those are some of our major losses. We've had other things such as the Kerrville Folk Festival and the Kerr County Fair have also canceled. Moving into uh, our Star Report, this is a research company that uh, does impact studies and, and uh, on hotel accommodations nationwide. Uh, and we, we purchase the study on a regional basis along with, uh, not in addition to Kerrville, it's Fredericksburg, Bernie, San Marcos, New Braunfels, and San Antonio. <clears throat> Our hotel occupancy rate was the highest of any of those cities for the three months ending in June, which would have been uh, April, May, and June with 44.5% occupancy. Fredericksburg had 35% occupancy and an average daily rate of $98.80. Bernie had 31% occupancy with an average rate of $87.17. San Marcos had 32% occupancy with an average daily rate of $69.62. And 
New Braunfels was 36.5% occupancy with a $79 rate. San Antonio was a 30% occupancy with an average daily rate of $68. So the, as you can see, we had some things that kind of helped us out uh, during the peak of the, of the downturn. Uh, we had some construction crews that were in town that helped boost our occupancy rate slice, uh, slightly. If you look at the 12 months, uh, the past 12 months, our occupancy rate is at 49%, almost 50. It's 49.9 with an average daily rate of $87.02. And, uh, and looking at the other communities, now we, we do have the uh, second lowest occupancy rate. San Marcos was lower than us by a few percentage points. Unfortunately, we've got the lowest average daily rate, and that is probably uh, one of the reasons behind that is our hotel inventory is older than most hotel inventories in the region. But even San Antonio had a rate for the year of 54.7%. Their average daily rate was $106. We are continuing to see uh, the leisure traveler coming to Kerrville. In fact, we've worked hard uh, con continuing to promote Kerrville as a destination and we have some things going for us there. One, Kerrville is a good drive destination. We're not dependent on commercial airlift to have our market come in and reach us. Kerrville is perceived to be a, an outdoor destination with a healthy environment and room to spread out. Our strong quality of life and our product mix continues to be excellent. Uh, and then four, we have excellent medical facilities if needed. So as a result, we've had three of our markets do extremely well recently. One is the motorcycle market, both individuals and groups coming through. And I'm sure all of you have seen the uh, uh, motorcycles that are here. The RV market is important to us. And we have more RV spaces in Kerr County than hotel rooms. And we've continued to promote that market heavily. Uh, we don't see occupancy tax revenue from that market, but we do see a lot of, of uh, taxes coming in in other forms, sales tax and what have you. They, they park their RVs and then they do spend time in restaurants and attractions and what have you. And then our short-term rental market has been extremely good. Once the initial scare was over, our B&Bs and our cabins have, have been full in our book. So we're seeing uh, uh, strong results there. So we're continuing to promote those markets. We're also con uh, promoting the, the meeting market. We've had several meetings recently with meeting planners that are still doing site visits and looking Kerrville over. So we're confident we're going to see that market bounce back also. The, uh, in our proposed budget that we're getting ready to go into, we divide our budget into three areas. Uh, administration uh, for the next year will be 29% of the budget and we, we make it a point to stay under 30% on administrative costs. Our visitor center operation is 11% of the budget and then 60% of our budget goes to advertising sales and promotion. As we get into the budget, uh, we've, uh, we have taken a, reduced our budget by 10% for, for this year over last year and breaking down our administrative cost. Uh, you can see our audit uh, is, is $5,100. Our administrative postage is 240. I think everything there is pretty self-explanatory. Now you see one comp says office and that's operations, that's taxes, rent, utilities. Our payroll, uh, we did not, uh, uh, no, no, no pay raises for the coming year. Uh, and we have furloughed a couple of employees. So we'll continue to monitor that. And once things get back to a little more sense of normalcy, we'll look at perhaps bringing those two individuals back on board. Our visitor center budget, uh, 
again, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the office section is, is again, operations, taxes, rent, and utilities. And that's split between the administrative and, and the uh, visitor center. So each of those pay $17,450 annually for operations. Going into uh, the third area, which is advertising and promotions, we're continuing to, to, or we will continue to promote there as much as we can. We have uh, cut way back on our advertising uh, throughout the COVID crisis, we completely eliminated our television advertising, uh, very little media, uh, print media. We've done, uh, we've continued in the motorcycle market and the RV market. Again, 60% 60, 60 of our budget is going to sales, promotion, and uh, advertising. Our advertising campaign is broken down into three areas be print media at 44%, television at 34%, and digital media at 22% for the coming year. And again, that will continue to shift. Uh, we'll continue to reduce print media as we move forward in the years ahead and increase digital media. The slide you see here are the print media publications that we will be advertising in. This touches every one of our markets. It touches uh, the meeting market, the, the, the motorcycle market, the RV market, um, and the leisure market. We do continue to spend a lot of time on market research to make sure we're spending those dollars as wisely as we can. Some of the merchant or some of the uh, research is purchased. The hotel industry research was the Smith the STAR report that we referred to a little earlier. Uh, we work very closely with the state and the governor's office on, on co-op leads and co-op information. Uh, we do some economic impact studies and then we do a lot of our demographics in-house. And we even during the uh, worst of the, of the COVID we've done, we've had some results. Uh, in July, for instance, we had 908 leads or requests for additional information. So we're continuing to promote Kerrville heavily throughout this time. As we look at uh, our visitor center guest, this is a little off from, from our normal operation. And this is this budget year from October until current till, till July. Uh, visitors coming into the visitor center, 44% were day trippers, 22% were overnight. 33% were local residents that came in needing information. Normally the day tripper and the overnight are fairly close to each other in the high thirties together and the local residents are, are pretty close to where they are now. Where are visitors staying? This is one that we've also seen a little, uh, little different pattern since the COVID is set in. 60% are staying in hotels, 24% are RV and campground visitors, and 16% are staying with friends and family. And that's beginning, the friends and family are picking back up. Uh, we were way down for one month on friends and family. Again, visitors were just leery about coming in and spending time with anybody. Our occupancy tax collections, uh, again, until we hit the, uh, COVID challenge, we were looking even better this year than last year. And last year was the best year in the history of the occupancy tax collections with a little over $1.4 million collected fiscal year 18 and 19. Following graphs were developed by Dean Runyon and Associates, which is uh, an organization that contracts with the Texas governor's office to do research statewide so that we're able to compare our numbers with other numbers across the state. Our direct travel spending, $76 million came into Kerrville last year from visitors outside the community. It created 1,210 jobs in Kerrville. That's not Kerr County, that's strictly within the city of Kerrville. 
So that was, those jobs were greatly impacted. Uh, hospitality industry suffered and continues to suffer somewhat with the job loss that we've experienced due to the virus. Now, one of the things that our office did is during the, again, the worst portion of this, we worked with the, with the restaurants every day, uh, updating information as far as curb service, takeout, delivery, uh, and kept that posted. We had a portal on our website where we worked with every single restaurant in Kerrville on what their services were and what they were doing and uh, keeping the public posted on what was available food-wise, restaurant-wise in Kerrville. Local tax revenue, again, for this past year, $2.7 million came into uh, the city of Kerrville as a result of visitors spending time in our community. For the county, uh, we saw for the direct travel spending, $112 million, which is up 2.8% from last year. Employment wise uh, in the county, it's 1,720 jobs, which is up 7.5% from the year before. Earnings of those employees is $44.8 million. Again, that was up seven point, almost 7.7%. .7%. Local sales tax revenue is 4.4 million, again, up 7.3%. And state sales tax for the county is 7.1 million, up 4.4% from last year. Return on investment. And again, this is a formula provided by the governor's office so that we can compare our numbers with uh, other numbers across the state, but with the $2.7 million generated by visitors to Kerrville divided by our budget, our, our 2019 budget of $942,000, that gave us a return on investment of $2.85 in new tax dollars returned for every $1 spent or invested. And then we won't take credit for every visitor coming to Kerrville, but when you look at the $76 million visitor spending uh, expenditure divided by our budget again last year of 942. That's a return on investment of $80.68 for every $1 invested in the tourism budget. Uh, travel industry conducted a survey just two weeks ago and uh, <clears throat> of, of the potential travelers in, in Texas. Stress levels are impacting how people feel about travel right now. 61 for, or 62 percent of the potential travelers say they will not travel until the crisis is over. 38 percent of the individuals feel they will be traveling this fall, and 44.5 say they will not travel until a vaccine is developed. 61 percent of the individuals expect things to get worse before they get better. 56% of the travelers feel they will be taking some type of staycation this year. That's another project that the hospitality industry in Kerrville is working on. And we, we met just last week with the, our, our industry partners. We're opening museums, uh, galleries, working to bring locals that may not have visited some of these facilities in the past. We're doing promotions. Our, uh, we're, we're putting a new video together, a little three to five minute snippet from every one of our partners that will be uh, put together and then we can use that as a video. Now, one of the, one of the things that hurts a little bit, 59.7% of those surveyed did not want visitors coming to the community right now. <laughs> our wrap up, uh, tourism is a vital cog in the economic recovery process for Kerrville. Unfortunately, we do have many positive components to help drive the recovery. All right, we encourage everyone to help restart our economic engine. And we're encouraging everyone to stay safe as you encourage visitors to explore Kerrville and urge your neighbors to enjoy a brief staycation right here at home by patronizing our local businesses, events, and activities. I'll be happy to address any questions you may have. Julie Davis is here also. If you've got other uh, questions, we'll be more than happy to address those. Council, questions, comments? I have a, hi, Julie. Um, hi. Charlie, it's Kim. Um, hi, I, Kim. I do have a couple of, of questions. And first, 
um, appreciation for sacrifices um, that everyone's making right now, including no pay raises. I know that's that's tough in the furlough as well. Um, so thank you for 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 that. And I, I'm I'm sorry we have to do that. But I, I have some questions about the advertising. Um, okay. I'm, I know we talked about, or or uh, Mark talked about, that how you were proactively looking for contracts that you could um, either, I guess, back out of without penalty, renegotiate. So in this situation we're in now, um, are you finding those kinds of contracts? Are you searching for those or those? Um... We, we we have searched and we have done that, and uh, fortunately our suppliers. Uh, have been good about working with us. Uh, uh, you know, for instance, we've canceled all our television. Our television contract for the year is canceled. Our uh, some of our other publications have been greatly reduced. Uh, the only things that we've really moved to for, or forward with are motorcycle advertising. Again, we're seeing such a strong motorcycle market here. We've continued to work with our 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 primary supplier, which is Ride Texas. And we've got a very key position in that publication. It's the inside back cover, full page, and they work with us on rates on that one. And then we uh, we have an annual contract with, with the Good Sam organization, which is the RV market. And we feel like that market is so important for our community that we continue to, to uh, and that's an annual contract. But yes, we have, we have uh, reduced and, and eliminated many of our magazine contracts and as a result you're not seeing our ads in the various publications right now so charlie if, uh, we don't know what's going to happen in 2020 and we know a lot of a lot of events can canceled in 2019 is there money that's kind of allocated for for events that we've had in the past if we're able to do that or would we anticipate you coming back and asking for money if things recover and if we're wanting to promote Kerrville in more ways than, than what you're planning for this year we don't have funding in our budget to do that. Uh, you know, what we are doing is we are continuing to encourage those those organizations to work with us. We're helping promote them uh, socially or social media. And then, uh, of course, our Arts Council is is involved also. They, they experienced a uh, reduction in, in their funding also uh, by 10% or, or thereabouts. So, but once things begin to turn around, we will begin to advertise and promote again. But as far as just funding to give to organizations and, and let them run with the ball, we do not have those funds budgeted or available. Okay, thank you. Nor do we have a plan to come back and ask for additional funds, yeah. Kim. Um, we kind of went into this with the thought process of hopeful that we won't be really doing a lot of advertising, say fall, winter, knowing that those events are not happening, but hoping that by say February, March, we can begin our normal, if you will, advertising campaigns again. And we typically promote those events through that, the, those advertising dollars that you see in the budget. Um, and then like special events, the ones that had canceled for fall, we took those and remove those dollars since they weren't happening. Sometimes we help them with an ad or a, a small sponsorship, but we don't give them a direct dollar like Charlie stated. Okay, okay, thank y'all both. We've got a couple of questions um, and uh, either Julie or Charlie. Uh, one, the, uh, the R RV market nationally is just booming. And I'm wondering if you were doing any planning about how to catch more of, of the RV market. And then the other thing has to do with the number of people moving out of, of cities or wanting to get out of cities. We've got folks come in here buying houses to move here, but apparently there is also this move of people who are gonna stay living in a city but they're trying to find ways to get out temporarily. Do you see uh, how you can catch either of those two? We we are continuing to advertise in the RV publications and, and uh, that is an important market for us. In fact, 
as, as I mentioned, we, we're the RVers or, or the, the market is is purchasing RVs. If you look at the RV lots right now, the sales lots, they're almost empty. They're having trouble getting inventory. A lot of folks that have never had RVs before are, are jumping into that bandwagon. Of course, in addition to the RV market or the RV publications, it's important that as soon as we can go back to our, our publications like Texas Highways and Texas Monthly, we'll do that because those RVers are using those publications to help in their decisions too. I do think we're going to see a real boost in one market or one one segment. Uh, I think the body shops are going to be doing extremely well in the next year or so because all these new RVers that may not be accustomed to driving uh, <laughs> RVs or motorhomes or pulling larger travel trailers are going to be having some little mishaps and what have you. So I think the body shops are going to do extremely well this next year. Yeah. Uh, Julie, you see anything with the folks trying to get out of the cities? Is there a way to, you know, I'm, I'm talking about they're, they're just getting out for several right. nights or whatever. Anyway. Right. As a visitor, yes. We do target um, we do target the major metro areas in Kerrville. We have, I, as long as I've been here, I know we have, but um, that tends to be our visit from uh, San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Houston. Houston's our biggest market. Um, and it's just like you said, they're getting out of the city to do um, something in the small town. We haven't gone after them for relocation since our focus is, is getting them to stay the night, but uh, we do continue to do that. We're doing that right now, mostly through social media by doing the really targeted um, placement of posts in front of those people since you can do zip codes and things of that nature. We've also published in, you know, like Houstonia and some of those, the television markets always hit those areas when we have television again. And according to kind of all of the researchers out there, that is going to be kind of one of our saving graces next year. And that COVID has obviously hit the larger metro areas much harder. And so those people are looking for a small, safe, outdoor place to go to, a drive market, and we are all of those. Now, of course, most of those individuals or most of, most of the new homeowners here are visitors before they are residents. They'll, they'll spend time in Kerrville uh, looking the area over before they make their decision to purchase here. All right, two, two more. One, do you know the e economic impact of the Kerrville Folk Festival? And second, um, the governor allowed the um, open air youth sports events to continue to happen. So we've had some at the sports complex. Do you see much impact there? Yes, sir. Uh, we are seeing sports events take place here. They, uh, and we've, we've worked with, with those individuals. They are, uh, I got to commend them. They are working really hard to keep their their uh, vis their visitors safe. Uh, they're encouraging those folks to spread out. They are masked. They have a, uh, a sanitizing stations located throughout the facility. So we have had some uh, new tournaments here in Kerrville recently. That's uh, and that again, that's a great market for us. Those individuals in some cases come in. They may come in on a Wednesday afternoon, play a game on Thursday. If they win that game, they may not play again until Saturday, but they will have a day or two that they are with downtime. So that gives them an opportunity to uh, see additional things and spend more money when they are here. So that market is very good for us. The youth camp market was better than we anticipated for the year. Uh, they did operate, they operate on a much shorter schedule than normal and under some very stringent guidelines established by the governor's office. But uh, we, we ha didn't have quite as many campers as we normally do, but, but the camps were satisfied for the most part and were relatively full. Uh, they just had different operations where one of the things about camp facilities is, is building those relationships and they weren't able to do as much of that as they have in the past because again, the campers were spread out. Uh, they may have little clusters of, of eight or 10 in one area and then 
three or 400 yards down the way, they have another cluster of eight or 10. So, so those, those groups did work. Even the meeting and, and uh, wedding market has done, is, is beginning to bounce back a little bit and the hotels are working with those individuals. One of the requirements there for is, uh, again, not using the entire facility. If, if, if our, our bigger meeting space, for instance, where they could, uh, rather than running 100% occupancy, they're running about 25% occupancy in the, in the meeting facilities. They have uh, employees with counters and they check as they as you go into that, that meeting facility. Uh, they click, uh, use a clicker to determine who's gone in. As they come out, they click you also so they know exactly how many people are in the meeting room at any given time. So uh, the industry is working very hard to accommodate some of those smaller meetings and weddings and things that are taking place and trying to be very cautious on how that's handled and making sure every effort is made to keep those visitors safe and secure. Anything else, Delane? I just want to add, um, uh, of all the entities we've been talking with for the last couple of months about budgets and money, yours is probably one of the most challenging with your primary business being welcoming visitors. So just keep up the good spirits. We really appreciate what y'all are doing. Uh, if we can ever help you in any way, uh, call on us. And um, thank you for a good report. We appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Charlie uh, or Julia, I did have a question. I was curious about, it looked like your print, you spend as well more money on print than you do on social media. Did I understand that right? You did. Uh, the reason behind that, Judy, is that the the uh, one the print is much more expensive than than the social media. But as long as we have an older boomer market and even a few seniors still traveling, you've got to have print in place. In other words, uh, that that boomer wants to be able to pick up a piece of paper or a magazine or a newspaper and and hold that in their hand, where uh, the younger markets are using social media for for their decision making. But uh, I think and, I and as I mentioned, as time goes on, we'll reduce that uh, print budget and increase the social media budget. But at this point, we're able to get uh, social media is just an, a less expensive market to work than print media. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I, I, I can relate to that. So, uh, so can I. <laughs> so, all right. Anything else, Council? All right. Well, that brings us to the end. Uh, Mr. Manager, do you have anything for us that no, you need to share with us? Uh, just that these will be on your next agenda. Some of them might even be on consent, but um, unless you all feel otherwise, but we've, I think, thoroughly uh, reviewed them at this point, and um, unless you all would like to do that differently, but. Okay. So the budget we have in front of us right now mirrors the numbers here. I know that there was one, you talked about one. That's yeah, right. But, All of them do except for the EIC with those adjustments that she mentioned. That she gave. Yeah, so Skymaster adjustments. Um, and that the was 20000 Everything else is going to. Yes. Yeah, and the interest income came from Okay, got it. Okay. All right. Well, Council, thank you for being here this morning. And at 1118, we are adjourned. Mm -hmm.